When the moon hangs high in the midnight sky Like a cat's claw scratching down And the wolves, they do howl For they smell something foul Mr. Whiskers has come to town He trundles out of the dark Looking for a lark You better pray you don't catch his eye For when he is done having his fun You just might wish you could die <laughs> My creepy kitties, it is I, your host, Mr. Whiskers the Mad Catter, here to bring you another episode of Twisted Tea Time. For tonight's tea, I'm drinking... something. That's a, pretty much it. I, I don't really know what it was. It, it was in the back of the cupboard. I... Cupboards are a little bit barren right now. And, well, there was a stray tea bag, so I decided to, um, try it. <sighs> That's not bad. Not bad at all. <sighs> well, I'm going to try and keep things simple tonight, kitties. After all, there are no reviews for me to read to you. You're all failing me, you know that? <sighs> but... I'll let that slide. For tonight, I've decided I'm going to teach you all a valuable lesson. It's a lesson about something dark, something full of danger, that can turn the unwitting into a spellcasting stranger. They summon chaos, horrors, and can incite rebellions. They can even turn kids into nighttime hellions. They can teach people about poison or even biology. Hell, some can even teach them political ideology. Whether they're left or they're right, it just plain doesn't matter, for these poor sods that use them are as mad as a catter. Clearly, the lesson from this that we should be learning is that books, my dear kitties, are only good for burning. Ignorance, as the saying goes, is bliss. So let's close down the schools, class dismissed. Well now, you say, you listen here. What are the stories that we all like to hear? Simple, I say. They shall remain. In fact, I've got plenty locked away in my brain. Books and the knowledge they teach are horrible things best kept out of reach. Summoning such demons of darkness and hate? Better to burn them and spare you all a horrible fate. I know, I know, you still don't believe me. Don't say I didn't warn you, but you will soon agree that books and their ilk should all go up in flames. Here, listen to this first story. It's called The Book of Names. The Book of Names by Author Unknown It was on a grim October morning that I chanced upon a rather odd and lengthy book while roaming about a particularly shabby library in Archangel, Virginia. The place was practically a historical monument as it was built in the early 1800s and survived the passing centuries with little repairs done to it. Besides the modernized innovations such as electricity and heating. Now, I am not one to delve into the dark arts or whatever you fancy calling it, but I was more than a little intrigued at this book's title. The Book of Names. It was large and sat upon a walnut-brown desk that looked almost as old as the town itself. The creaking wooden chair that sat behind it looked the same. I slowly sat down on the chair, careful to avoid it collapsing if it was not as sturdy as I hoped. When I settled in comfortably, I took a long look at the book. 
The cover was characterless, as it only displayed a black void to me, though I did see the letters D-A etched in a small print at the bottom right of the tome. Initials, I assumed. The writer's initials. I took the cover in my hand and lifted it to a blank page. Taking that page, I lifted it to another blank page. And after lifting the second blank page, I finally discovered the words, The Book of Names. Below it were the initials, D-A. And this time, under the initials, were the words, Those that do not know the power of the secret words would be wise not to read further. Those that do not know the meaning of names would be wise not to read further. Those that do not understand the meaning of these words would be wise not to read further. Those that are aware of the power of the secret words, of the meaning of names, and the meaning of the words thusly read, would be wise to continue reading with immeasurable caution. Do not abuse the secret words. D. A. As I read that passage, an overwhelming sense of apprehension came over me, but my scholarly interest forced me to turn another page. This page revealed to me a list of locations in very small, handwritten print. I soon realized that what I was looking at was a list of countries and the provinces, cities, and towns within those countries. As I skipped to a few other pages, I found only a list of different countries and came to the fact that this probably had every city, town, province, or country in the world. After searching for a few minutes, I was able to find Archangel Virginia, United States of America. And then on the far right, the number 3968. It didn't surprise me that the book had more than 3,000 pages in it. It was quite a behemoth. Turning to page 3,968, I found a list of names that seemed to be in alphabetical order. Aaron Aronson, Aaron Abercrombie, Aaron Abernathy. The list of names went on and on for pages after. I skipped a couple hundred pages and found only more names. Skipping another couple hundred pages, I found only more names. Now, skipping more than a couple thousand pages, I came across one titled Ritual Words. Turning that page, I found a list of words that did not seem to be English though they were written with English letters. I read out loud in a hushed voice, Nosage, Naj, Theed. I don't know why, I don't know how to explain it, but to me the words sounded evil. I read another set of words aloud, Semage, Zela, Inog. And these sounded inhuman, unnatural to me as well. I continued to read the list of unnatural and evil sounding words, but soon went back to the name section of the book. Going back to Archangel, I continued to read the names. Name after name of names that I didn't recognize, but there was one that I did recognize. The librarian had told me that his name was Johannes Steinberg, and sure enough, here was the name, Johannes Rudolf Albert Steinberg. I said it out loud. 
Johannes Rudolf Albert Steinberg, and then for some odd reason stated the ritual words, Simaj Zela Inog. I don't know why I thought something would happen. I suppose... I don't know. Then suddenly I heard a woman scream. I jumped and turned around towards the direction of the screaming, quickly getting out of my chair to see what was the matter. What's wrong? What's happened? Asked one of the men standing by, also going to see what was wrong. The librarian! He just... He just... He's dead! Shouted the woman who I assumed had screamed in the first place. A gush of hushed voices erupted around the room. I stood there. The power of the secret words. Had I... somehow killed the man by saying his name, and then the ritual words? The more I thought of it, the more I came to the grim realization that I may have caused the death of Johannes Steinberg. I ran back to that evil, venomous book that could not have been made by any righteous being, and desperately searched for my name. I eventually found it and said, Andrew Charlton Ward, and then, Simaj Zela Inog. I had taken the life of a man, and was not fit to live. I dropped. Those that do not know the power of the secret words would be wise not to read further. Those that do not know the meaning of names would be wise not to read further. Those that do not know the meaning of these words would be wise not to read further. There now, you see, it isn't that hard. Now let's burn the whole library out in the yard. Wait, that didn't convince? What, you, you needed more gory? <sighs> the next one shows the horror in a children's story. Surely this one will get my point past your mental goalie. It's about a book regarding a clown named Roly Poly. If you find a book called The Tale of Roly Poly, don't open it. Don't read it. By Claremonde. The book doesn't look particularly creepy. There are no ominous images on the cover, no words of foreboding. There is only a plain red canvas with gold letters that read, The Tale of Roly Poly. I never saw the book until Ginny pulled it from her collection on the shelf. It may have been left by the previous owners. We had only moved into this neighborhood a month ago. Ginny was already snuggled under the covers when I opened the book. At six, 
she was starting to read and never needed to be coaxed to bed if I promised her a story. Well, almost never. Princesses were her obsession, and we'd cover most of the classics like Sleeping Beauty and Cinderella. The tale of Roly-Poly was a departure from the usual set list. Are you sure you want this one, Pumpkin? Ginny yawned. Yes, Daddy. I shrugged and began to read. There were two boys, two children like you. One was called Jack, and the other was Hugh. The boys sat in their room, for there was nothing to do. They were so bored, a common bugaboo. The book contained a simple illustration of two boys in a bedroom decorated with baseball-themed wallpaper. They thought and they thought. They huffed and they puffed. Until Hugh said, Phew! Enough is enough. Let's play a game. We'll upend this loose end. I know, said Jack. I'll call on my friend. I groaned internally and hoped that Ginny would fall asleep soon. This wasn't exactly Dr. Seuss. Jack took the book and said the words written down. Come out, come out, you silly old clown. With a wish and a whoosh and fizzle and pop, Roly-Poly arrived with a great big plop. There was an enormous figure that dwarfed the two boys next to him. The man was dressed as a traditional pantomime clown complete with a rough, white makeup and garish red lips. How do, said the clown, I've come to play. You, said Hugh, oh dear, holy mole! Don't be scared declared Jack. It's just roly-poly. What shall we do? said Hugh, all a flutter, as he pulled out his toys from the bedroom clutter. There were many games of various names, all wires and megawatts. A singing machine, a trampoline, there were even two robots. Oh no, said the clown. This will not do. Let's play some real games. Ditch this techno voodoo. Come with me and you'll see my home is quite grand. You'll have all you need in topsy-turvy land. The two boys nodded, their hearts filled with glee. They took the clown's hand and counted three Mississippi. Hugh and Jack closed their eyes as the world twirled and twirled. They whooped with joy as a new land was unfurled. The clown's home was quite splendid, full of candles and treats. The fun never ended. No parents, no chores, no bedtime or rules. No horrible homework from boring old schools. The boys played and played, and all three were glad, until one fateful day when the clown became sad. What's wrong, Roly-Poly? Is there something we can do? The boys asked and asked, but their worry still grew. Oh dear, the clown mumbled, my apologies most humbled. I'm just very hungry, as his large tummy rumbled. Would you like chocolate or chips or gooey cream cake? We have hot dogs and ice cream and every milkshake. But the clown shook his head, for his belly did ache. Then he grabbed little Hugh. A fine meal you'll make! My stomach flipped when I saw the contents of the next page. I shut the book immediately. Let's call it a night, princess. Ginny tried to protest, but her eyelids were heavy with sleep. What happened to the boy, daddy? I'll 
tell you tomorrow. I kissed Ginny on the forehead and turned out the lights. I went downstairs and poured a large glass of wine before reopening the book. The page that I'd closed contained an illustration of a gruesome scene. The clown held one of the boys above his head and had bitten into the child's left side. His teeth tore away chunks of pink flesh as blood trickled down his ruby-stained lips. The boy's eyes were shut, his tear-streaked face frozen in an agonized expression. Spurned on by morbid curiosity, I continued to read. Roly-poly grabbed the boy and held him aloft. He took a big bite. Sweet Hugh was so soft. He gnashed and he gnawed, he chewed and he slurped, and when nothing was left, the clown loudly burped. He looked around, there was no Jack to be found. The boy had run, the chase had begun. This place is large, indeed it does sprawl. There's no way out, no way at all. The clown was quite right, for try as he might, Jack rushed to escape, but there was no exit in sight. The boy grew tired, his breath became weary. Roly-poly caught up, sounding quite cheery. You're tougher than most. You I will cook. And he hung the boy up on an old meat hook. The child screamed and he shouted, You great fat liar! The clown licked his lips and stoked the big fire. I turned to the last page. The boy dangled from a hook over a gaping fire pit. Parts of his skin were cracked and blackened as the flames licked his small frame. The clown prodded the fire with a stick in one hand. The other hand waved to the reader as a maniacal smile revealed two rows of long, sharp teeth. The clown was so happy, this sweet meat was a treat. Hail to the chef, bon appetit. I woke up early the next morning and took the paper lying on the doorstep. It was Sunday, but I never liked to sleep in. I put on a pot of coffee and glanced at the headline on the countertop. My heart froze. Fifth anniversary of local boys' disappearance. Hundreds have taken part in a remembrance rally to mark the fifth anniversary of the disappearances of brothers Hugh and Jack Healy. The brothers, aged eight and six, were abducted from their home on January 7th, 2012. Police have issued a fresh appeal for information this weekend. Story continued on page three. I ran outside and removed the cover of the trash can. Perhaps whoever wrote that book knew something about the boy's disappearance. At the very least, I needed to report this sick material to the police. My stomach lurched as I regarded the contents of the can. The book was gone. A primal panic rose in my chest as I dashed upstairs to Ginny's bedroom. A single piece of paper lay atop the crumpled sheets of her empty bed. Ginny picked a good book, a true tale to excite, but Dad did not like it. He thought it was trite. He stopped the story at the moment of glory. Oh no, not for you, this part is unfit. The clown did not like that, not one little bit. So Roly-Poly told Ginny, who was ever so skinny, Let's have some fun, we'll show that old ninny. And now Ginny plays in the land of topsy-turvy, full of sugar and spice and all things that are girly, while the princess holds court in dresses of satin. The clown simply smiles. Oh, she'll do. She'll fatten. 
<laughs> it's been one week since Ginny went missing. I've given the page to the cops, but they're as baffled as I am. Every hellish verse of that awful book is seared into my skull. I can't sleep. I can't eat. I'm typing this as both an appeal and a warning. If you find this book, don't open it. Don't read it. Call the police. A child's life may depend on it. Now, have you learned the lesson that books are not something with which to be messing? But I see that you still doubt. So to drive my point home, here's another story to fill up your dome. Maybe after this one, you will concede. I believe it's called Jason Loved to Read. Jason Loved to Read by Umbrella Jason loved to read. Every day he would take a walk to a nice place, like the park or the beach, and sit down to read for hours. It didn't matter what the story was about, or who the author was, because Jason just loved to to read. One weekend, his usual places were a little crowded due to the gorgeous weather. He decided to take a walk in the woods to see if he could find a clearing or an interesting log where he could relax and lose himself in a book. Jason walked through the forest for quite some time. These particular woods weren't good for hiking and had no trails, so he was sure to have some solitude. He wasn't sure how far he had walked before he came upon the mysterious building. It looked somewhat like an old bank, and was covered in moss and vines. The doors were open and falling off the hinges, and the windows were filthy and broken. Jason figured this strangely placed building might be just what he was looking for. As he entered through the crumbling doorway, he saw dozens of shelves lined with books. What was a library doing in the middle of the woods? It didn't matter to Jason. All that mattered was that he was staring at what might possibly be a treasure trove of unread narratives. He wasted no time grabbing a random book off the closest shelf as he dropped his book bag without care for its contents. Jason inspected the book, and it was surely something he had never heard of. He returned it to the shelf and went to further investigate the library. The whole place was filthy, but there wasn't any random clutter like one might expect from an abandoned building. But why was it abandoned? Who could just leave all these books to rot? Jason only thought about it for a moment, as he was too engaged in reading the names of all the books, wondering if he'd find something he recognized. He didn't find anything remotely familiar. Books were meant to be read, and Jason felt like these books weren't fulfilling their purpose. 
and for a long time, it seemed. It was time to start reading. He picked one called Black Wing Adventures and sat Indian style on the floor. The story was incredible. It had everything anyone could want in a good book. Adventure, romance, action, even philosophy. But it wasn't just that it had so many good qualities. It was that those qualities shined so much brighter than anything he had ever read. If this book was this amazing, what treasures did the other books hold? Jason was excited in a way he had never felt before. It was getting late, and Jason knew that his girlfriend, Melissa, would be pissed that he wasn't answering her texts. Normally, she understood that this was Jason's me time, but he usually came home hours ago. He took the book with him so he could finish it later and started his journey home. He wasn't sure if he would find the library again, so he marked trees along the way with a sharpie he had in his book bag. Jason got up a little early the next morning so he could read. He grabbed his book bag and took out what he expected to be Black Wing Adventures. The book now had a different title. Love Without a Friend. More rummaging through the bag produced only his other boring books that he had previously been excited to read. Did he grab the wrong book? No, that wasn't possible. He hadn't let go of the book before putting it into his bag. It was obviously from the same library because it was covered in thick dust. He must have taken the wrong book. It was the only explanation. He decided that he would read Love Without a Friend, even though the title didn't really seem anywhere near as cool as Black Wing Adventures. Boy, was he wrong. It was just as good. It didn't have adventure or action, but it had a strikingly human quality to it. Jason had never felt the kinds of emotions the story was invoking. Turning each page was like opening a Christmas present. He couldn't wait to receive each word, each thought, each feeling. It was late, and Jason began to nod off. He didn't want to stop reading, but eventually he passed out. The next morning, he was still holding the book in his hands. It was still opened to the page he left off on, and he started to read again. He had no idea what he was reading. The story had completely changed. There were different characters, different thoughts, different feelings. He closed the book and looked at the title. It was Men and Monsters. Jason was even more shocked than the first time. The book hadn't left his hands. He hadn't returned to the library to exchange it for another book. None of this was possible. And Jason was getting understandably freaked out. All he could think of doing was going back to the library. Maybe he could find one of the other books he was reading. Upon his arrival, Jason received a text message from Melissa that read, Are you ignoring me? He responded, telling her he had found a new spot in the woods to read. He left out the part about a mysterious library with curious books, figuring it would only lead to more questions. Once Melissa's concern had diminished, Jason shut off his phone. When he got inside the library, he searched long and hard for Black Wing Adventures, or Love Without a Friend. But he was unsuccessful. In fact, none of the titles he remembered from before were anywhere to be found. Every book was different. Could this be another abandoned library? How many could there possibly be? Even one seemed strange. 
Jason just wanted to experience what these books were capable of, so he didn't want to think about how strange the whole situation had become. He just wanted to read. He knew he didn't have much time, so he quickly grabbed a book called Our Nation's Last Hero. It was a political drama with as many twists and turns as a great mystery. Jason had never read anything like it. He rarely thought about politics, but it was suddenly the most interesting subject in the world. It started getting dark, so once again, Jason left the library and took the book he had been reading. He hoped it would still be the same book when he woke up in the morning. Unfortunately, it wasn't. Jason didn't know what to do. These books were amazing, but apparently he wasn't able to finish one unless he read it in less than 24 hours. He was going to have to stay awake for a long time. So he packed his book bag with caffeinated energy drinks and a few deli sandwiches in case he got hungry. Jason knew Melissa would be looking for him, but he didn't care. He cared so little that he left his phone at home on purpose. And so it began. Jason was on a mission to finish one of the magical changing books. What else could they be but magical? A book that changes every day. What an incredible thing. Though Jason had been upset about not being able to finish one, he was thrilled at the fact that he was reading books that no one else would ever read. If he managed to finish one, he would be as satisfied as he could ever be in his whole life. He chose a book called The Lion's Tears and began reading. As he read, he would periodically take a few swigs of energy drink and take a bite of sandwich. Eventually, he ran out of drinks and began crashing from all of the caffeine. It was too soon. He hadn't finished the book. There were just a few chapters left, but he couldn't stay awake any longer. He hoped that he would wake up again before the book changed. When he awoke, it seemed as though the next day had not yet come. But the book was still transformed into something new. Jason decided he was wrong about when the change occurred. It wasn't when the next day came. It was whenever he fell asleep. Jason stopped leaving the library. He had no time to walk back and forth or spend time with his girlfriend or do anything other than read the magical books. He tried to stay awake long enough to finish one, but it was no use. He just kept falling asleep. Jason was getting angry now. This wasn't a treasure trove of beautiful works of fiction. It was a curse. He was obsessed with finishing one of the books and it was eating away at his sanity. No food, no water, no contact with other human beings. When Jason would begin to fall asleep, he would take a piece of broken glass from one of the windows and cut himself to stay awake. After several cuts, he began to feel weak from blood loss. His mind was becoming warped as he sucked every word into his now crippled consciousness. The books he chose became more and more macabre. Titles like Making Love to Murder and The Man Who Ate Himself were overtaking the other more gentle ones. If Jason was going to finish one of these books, it had to be something that interested him. The gentle things were no longer in his interest. There was no telling how long Jason had been in the library. He wasn't eating or drinking, but somehow he wasn't hungry or thirsty anymore. It was as if the books were keeping him alive. They wanted him to read. They wanted him to finish. 
He kept getting closer and closer to finishing one of the books. He was sleeping less and less, and his dream was going to soon come true. But which book would be the lucky one? Which one would be read from front to back by a willing participant? He picked up a book off the shelf and looked at the title. It was called, Jason Loves to Read. His eyes widened. His mind raced. What an amazing coincidence. A book with his name on the title. And it's about someone who loves to read. Adrenaline rushed through Jason's body as he opened the book and began the first chapter. He read of a teenage boy who found an abandoned library in the woods. He read about books that magically changed their content whenever the protagonist fell asleep. He read about himself. This was the book that he would finish. This was the book that he had to finish. Jason's heart pounded like mad as he reached the final chapter when suddenly he was interrupted by a shouting female. What the hell, Jason? This is where you've been? I've been calling, I've been texting, everyone is looking for you. I only found this place because I happened to see those marks on the trees and thought that maybe you had made them. Hello? Jason? Are you deaf? Just then, she noticed the cuts all over Jason's body. She fell silent and took a step back. Here was her boyfriend, cut up and bloody, buried in a book, paying no attention to her tirade. Jason? What's going on? Are you all right? Why won't you look at me? Jason? Her voice was concerned, but hesitant. Jason just sat there, Indian style, reading his book. Melissa lost her temper. Look at me, Jason. What the fuck? She began to cry. All she wanted was to find her boyfriend and discover why he had been missing. She expected him to embrace her and tell her that they were together again and everything was going to be all right. She ran to him, bent down, grabbed his arm, and shouted, Jason! In a split second, Jason grabbed a piece of broken glass already covered in blood from using it to cut himself and jammed it firmly into Melissa's neck. Her eyes became wild with fear, and she gurgled and jiggled, eventually falling to the floor with the glass still in her neck. Jason's face had no expression as he continued reading his book, his legacy. It was about to happen. The last page. Jason couldn't believe it. He had finally stayed awake long enough to finish one of the magical books from the mysterious abandoned library in the middle of the woods. His hands shook as he turned the page and saw the words, The End, towards the bottom, below the final paragraphs. It was then that he became horrified for the first time in his entire life. The book ended with the protagonist, Jason, stabbing his girlfriend in the neck with a shard of broken glass. Jason didn't move, didn't blink, or even think. He just sat there in absolute shock. Was this really happening? Why did the book say that he killed his girlfriend? 
That was impossible. Jason was no killer. He just loved to read. He stood up and screamed a desperate, primal scream, throwing the book to the floor next to Melissa's body. He looked at her as if noticing her for the first time. There was blood all over the floor. Melissa was surely dead, and Jason must have been the murderer. He walked home in a daze and called 911 to turn himself in. According to Jason's story, the police expected to find Melissa's body in an abandoned building in the woods. When they arrived at the proper location, they found only her corpse amid the blood-stained leaves and branches, nothing that resembled a library anywhere in sight. The details of the trial and conviction aren't extraordinary, but what you may find interesting is what happened when Jason arrived at prison. His cellmate offered him a book to pass the time. Jason politely replied, No thanks. I hate to read. So we have had death and murder and a cannibal clown. Surely that will convince you we must burn it all down. Now here's a lighter, some gasoline, so go set it all alight. Thank you, my friend, for fighting the good fight. The library is uh, three blocks down and one to the right. Never mind the writhing things that are just out of sight. You'll do fine. You'll be safe. Just believe in yourself. Imagine the unimaginable horrors as some stupid elf. Cleanse it all with fire, cleanse it with flame. Just don't look too much, or it might drive you insane. Who opened the portal into some Lovecraftian hell? I have no clue at all who told the death knell. Whomever it is, I'm sure they got eight. Now... Uh, hurry along, hurry along, get out of here, or, or else you'll be late. Jeeves Crapst, I thought they'd never leave. Oh, you're still here. Nah, that one is delusional. I figured I'd give him and the local fire department something to do for the evening. They only like it when I speak in rhyme, weirdo. Anyway, I'm going to go curl up with a good book I checked out from the library. Here, you can read, um, this one. Don't look at me like that. Sheesh. Good night, sleep tight, and, uh... <laughs> Don't let the eldritch horrors bite. <laughs> The Mad Catter presents Twisted Tea Time is copyright 2018 by Z.P. Gowdy. All stories are the properties of their respective authors and are obtained via direct permission, creative commons, or their simply public domain. Music for Twisted Tea Time is used courtesy of Kevin McLeod and Incompetech.com, Mew at soundcloud.com forward slash myuu and jason white at soundcloud.com forward slash angels dash of dash despair 
If you want to support the show and help us grow, then leave a review or rating on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, or go to patreon.com forward slash lamadcatter and sign up for a low-cost monthly subscription in order to get bonus goodies. For more of me and my mischief, you could find my charming grin on facebook.com forward slash Cheshire Hats or on Twitter at one numerical one Mad Catter. You can also download past episodes from SoundCloud at soundcloud.com forward slash Cheshire Hats. Good night, my kitties. Pleasant dreams.